Muggy and the school glide through the mangrove roots that grow along one of the islands in Turtle Bay. Twenty acres of the mangrove shore, plus some other land, form the Island Bay National Wildlife Refuge. Nearby is a fish shack built on pilings with water all around. It is a historic building because it shows a way of life from the past. Some fish shacks have rotted away and others have burned, but a few exist. Muggy and the school of fish glide beneath one. Barnacles and sea squirts grow on the pilings. Muggy hears someone playing a guitar and then footsteps. Muggy sees legs splashing into the water as a man and a boy sit on the deck. Then Muggy hears their voices. Tell, tell me the story, Daddy, about the fish shack. You've heard it before, son. I know, I want to hear it again. The man says. Fishmen netted so many fish that their boat couldn't hold them off. They unloaded the fish here and kept on fishing. Another boat called a run boat picked up the fish and took them from the fish company and took them to the fish companies in, Pont in Ponta Gorda. Muggy swims near their feet. Air bubbles cling to the man's leg hairs. The boy asks, Why didn't the fishermen just get, just, just come back and get them at the end of the day? Muggy circles the feet of the boy. His father says, If it was a good day of fishing, there would be too many. And even if it wasn't a good day, they would go bad waiting all day. You know how hot it is today? Imagine if the shack were full of dead fish. It would stink, the boy says. Muggy watches the boy's toes wiggle. That's right. So, so the run boat would get the fish to the fish company while it was still fresh. That's important for any fish, but especially mullet. Why? No one knows why, but mullet don't keep. Mullet heads, the people who really love mullet, say you should eat them as soon as you catch them. Muggy sees a grouper near one of the pilings. He and the other little fish hurry away. Hi, I'm Carol Mahler, author of Adventures in the Charlotte Harbor Watershed, a story of four animals and their neighborhoods. I'm here today with the adventurers and Angie McStravick. Hi, Carol. I'm with the Environmental Education Program of Lee County Schools, and I'm happy to be here today. I'm glad to have you. Mm -hmm. And I, I hope you'll read this section about mullet life, written by Lisa Figueroa from Taylor Ranch School in Sarasota County. I'd be happy to. Striped mullet like warm coastal water that varies from salty to fresh. They live near streams and rivers or in brackish bays, inlets, and lagoons with sand or mud bottoms. They school or swim together for protection. Larger fish, turtles, water snakes, and wading birds prey on them. Mullet often leap from the water and some scientists think they are escaping predators. Others think they are clearing their gills and collecting oxygen since they live in oxygen-poor water. They are always eating tiny animals, zooplankton, bottom-dwelling benthic organisms, bits of dead plants and animals, detritus, and small animals with no bones, invertebrates. Thank you so much for reading that, Angie. My pleasure, Carol. Now, some of the words in this particular section are in parentheses, and they're kind of hard words. Why do sure. we include them? It's important in an educational resource like this to include the proper scientific name. It completes the book in a way that brings it just from a story to a complete educational resource. Um, and how about this idea of why the mullet jump out of the water? Now, there are lots of different ideas as to why You're they right. do it. I've heard several theories on it or several ideas as to why they do. The most common one that I know of is that they jump to clear their gills, which makes sense since they're bottom feeders and they eat a lot of vegetation out of the sand. So they don't really eat other fish? No, they're complete vegetarians. Now, are there other fish that are vegetarians that you know about? Well, I can, we can talk about more of a mammal like the manatee, who is a complete or manatee, who is a complete vegetarian and eats off the bottom as well and has trouble also with taking in a lot of sand and extra things that they pick up on the bottom while they're eating those beautiful sea grasses. But it's very unusual for a fish to be yes, a vegetarian. Yes. Mm -hmm. So this is one of the most unique and most unusual fish in our watershed. It is. And we treat him like a hero here in Southwest Florida because he is so popular. And we, we enjoy him. Thank you so much for talking with us. My and pleasure. 
And thank you for joining us here in the television studios of the School District of Lee County. Muggy sees the large silvery flashes of a Silver King tarpon. Most fish get oxygen from the water through their gills, but tarpon also have a swim bladder that works like a lung. Like a roller coaster, they move up and down, in and out of the water. When they are out of the water, they can breathe air. Sometimes water in Charlotte Harbor can be very low in oxygen. Schools of mullet must swim away to survive, but tarpon can stay because they breathe oxygen from the air. A channel marker guides boats bringing people to Cayo Costa State Park. An anhinga sits on the marker and holds its wings open to dry. It watches Muggy and the school of fish twist in and out of the maze of mangrove roots. Three brown pelicans skim low across the water. The channel is called Pelican Pass. Boats go through the pass into Pelican Bay, stopping at the docks. Muggy hears splashing. He watches the feet of a girl and boy wading into the water. He hears the girl say, Do you see the little fish? She points to Muggy and the other mullet. The boy says, Yeah, but that's nothing like Gasparilla Island State Park where we were yesterday. That seemed like a desert to me. All hot sand, says the girl. But what about those cool iguanas? The boy reaches into the water to pick up a shell. Muggy and the other fish dart away. The girl says, I didn't like the iguana. They look scary, and they don't belong there. They chase away the animals that are supposed to live there. I like chasing them. The boy tosses his shell. Muggy hears the kerplop when it hits the water and watches the shell sink to the bottom. The girl says, I like that old lighthouse. Your family lived there, and I thought about how it would feel to live there. Oh, who cares about some old building? Let's go. The boy says. They turn and run back to the shore. Muggy and the mullet scoot away. I'm Rick Tully. I'm with the Environmental Education Program of Lee County Schools. I'll be reading some text written by Barbara Davis from Port Charlotte Middle School in Charlotte County. She wrote about hypoxia. Plants and animals need oxygen to live. Hypoxia occurs when water does not have enough oxygen to support life. Warm water holds less oxygen than cold water. In the summer, hypoxia can happen when the creatures breathe all the oxygen in shallow, warm water. Also, warm water from the Peace and Myaka rivers flows above the harbor's cooler salt water like a blanket, causing hypoxia. This may be a natural condition, but too much fertilizer or sewage treatment plant discharge creates food for algae. When algae grows well, it blocks sunlight. Some animals can move away or protect themselves from hypoxia, but others, like plants, cannot. And another situation that often happens with, that creates hypoxia is when all of these algae plants die and they fall to the bottom and they begin to decompose, that decomposition, that rotting process, also takes up more and more of the oxygen. So that extra fertilizer uh, can reduce the oxygen in the water from a whole variety of different mechanisms. Muggy and the School of Mullet swim through Pine Island Sound. There are 17 islands in the Pine Island National Wildlife Refuge. Some of these mangrove islands are close to the public and are home to herons, egrets, and pelicans. These birds like to eat mullet, so the school stays away. Pine Island Sound is home to many kinds of shellfish, including clams. Just west of Cork Island, the school of mullet swims over clams growing under mesh. They have been planted by clam farmers. The mesh protects the clams from being eaten by stingrays, sheep's head, blue crabs, tulip shells, or king's crowns. The farmers have to remove sponges, sea squirts, and barnacles that grow on the mesh so the clams will live. A boat drifts above and Muggy hears the first man say, 
Fishing for fishing for a living was easier before the net ban. You bet. The second man says. The first man says. Remember when we were mullet wrappers? We knew we had a school when a bunch of mullet started jumping. Or when the pelicans started circling and diving. Don't forget them. The second man laughs. The first man says. I hated it when they tried to steal the mullet as we, as we wrapped the nets around the school. Muggy noses the hull of the boat. That was the fun part. The real work was hauling the net in, pulling the mullet through the mesh, and icing them down. The second man says. It was work, but not like farming plan. The first man says. At least when we were out in the boat, I felt free. You're, you're out in the boat now, free as can be. The second man says. It is not the same. The first man says, Muggy and the school of mullets scoot away. Hi, I'm Carol Mahler, author of Adventures in the Charlotte Harbor Watershed. Today, I'm at the television studios of the school district of Lee County, and with me is Rick Tully. Hi, I'm with the Environmental Education Program of the school district of Lee County. But I'd like to read some text that you wrote uh, in this book about shellfish and aquaculture. More than 275 kinds of shellfish live in the estuary. In the past, people harvested clams, oysters, and scallops to eat. Shellfish feed on things floating in the water, so they work as filters. If the water is clean, the shellfish are healthy. But when red tide, bacteria, or chemicals are in the water, the shellfish keep those harmful things. They can cause the shellfish to die, or the shellfish may make the people who eat them sick. Pollution has closed many parts of the estuary to shellfishing, but not Gasparilla Sound and Pine Island Sound. Clam farmers there lease bottomlands to raise clams for people to eat. This is a type of farming called aquaculture. Thanks for reading that, Rick. Now, let's look at that word aquaculture. It looks an awful lot like agriculture. And indeed it is. Agriculture is culturing or farming on land, and aquaculture is culturing or farming in the aqua in the water. So we are using the water and the, in water, the water environment to raise organisms that uh, are, are useful to us. Well, and what are the benefits of um, aquaculture? Well, there are many benefits, but they're sort of on two sides. On the one side, there's a real benefit to the natural environment because the reintroduction of these shellfish these filter feeders, uh, helps to clean the water. As filter feeders, they're pumping water through their bodies, the clams, the oysters, the scallops. They're pumping water through their bodies, filtering out tiny organisms, using them as their food. And in the process, they're cleaning up the water. It's also beneficial to humans because it provides us with food, with specific things that we like to eat. We love clams and oysters and scallops and this aquaculture provides that for us. Thanks so much for that explanation, Rick, and I've really enjoyed talking with you today. It's been a pleasure. free classroom materials, please visit our website at www.chnep.org.